we're spending 3.8 trillion dollars a year on healthcare costs mm, in the yeah. US. And the reality is that people are getting sicker, people are getting fatter, and people are getting more depressed. And if you're a doctor and you're looking at those realities, which are true, we're spending more and more every year and people are getting sicker, yeah, fatter, yeah. and more depressed, what are you doing? If yeah. you're not stopping and saying, why? We're dealing with the metabolic disease epidemic, which is the leading driver of mortality in the Western world now. Nine of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States are directly attributable to dysfunctional blood sugar or are worsened. Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's dementia, fatty liver disease. The root cause is a problem with metabolism. Over 50% of Americans have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. It's insane. That number should be close to zero. 88% of Americans have at least one biomarker of metabolic dysfunction. Alzheimer's dementia, which is now being called type 3 diabetes because it's so related to blood sugar. Cancer is very much driven by blood sugar. Chronic kidney disease, a problem of the small vessels in the kidney becoming narrowed in part because of metabolic dysfunction and erratic blood sugar control. Chronic lower respiratory infections of one of the leading causes of death. And we know that people with unstable elevated blood sugar have much higher mortality, even with something like influenza or pneumonia. With COVID, we've known now since the very beginning of the pandemic that having metabolic dysfunction, diabetes is a key accelerator and driver of mortality and morbidity. High blood sugar on its own can cause immune cell dysfunction. Basically for an immune cell to work and to do its job, it has to get to the site of infection in the body. It literally has to move through the bloodstream, out of the bloodstream, into the tissue and fight the infection and the cells that are infected. High blood sugar can directly impair the cell's ability to both move and phagocytose. We're literally stunting the ability of our immune cells to do their job just by having elevated blood sugar. There's some odd ones on there too. For instance, suicide is actually on the top 10 list of killers in the United States and people with diabetes or metabolic dysfunction actually have higher risk of suicide. Even other subtle things that aren't necessarily killers, but are their pain points like erectile dysfunction, infertility, gout, depression, anxiety, etc. When there's more fear and anxiety, it's going to drive that high cortisol and catecholamine state that leads us to be more metabolically dysfunctional. If you ask the average person with depression and anxiety, are you tracking your blood sugar? Do you know where you stand on the metabolic health spectrum? I think the majority are going to say no, even though there's a strong both epidemiologic and mechanistic linking the two. If you're just going along the normal American cultural treadmill of what's normal to eat, you're on a glucose roller coaster. We're eating about somewhere between like 60 and 152 pounds of added sugar per year on our diet. Probably 100, 200 years ago, you were eating less than maybe a pound per year. It just wasn't accessible. But now our government literally subsidizes the production of high fructose corn syrup and sugar. We are eating so much of it. It's cheap. It's accessible. It's everywhere. It's in all our packaged foods. Our bodies are overwhelmed with this substrate and it's leading to cellular dysfunction that's setting us up for insulin resistance and glucose dysregulation. The majority of foods on the shelves in our grocery stores now have added sugar, like well over 60%. So it's not unusual for an American to be on that blood sugar roller coaster up, down, up, down, up, down. And that's called glycemic variability. Mm. And that process of glycemic variability is very damaging to our metabolism. When your blood sugar acutely goes really high, like after eating a Pop-Tart or eating a pastry or something like that, or a big bowl of pasta, that spike can lead to inflammation. It can lead to oxidative stress because of the way that it's overwhelming our systems and creating free radicals. It can also cause a process called glycation. Glycation is sugar sticking to things like fat, proteins, DNA, whatever. And that sugar sticking to molecules, which sometimes is called rusting of the body, leads to dysfunction in those things. So you don't want glycation. And when blood sugar is high, it's going to stick to more stuff. Well, the one that will like affect you and that you can kind of notice is reactive hypoglycemia. You know, you eat a bunch of carbohydrates. Um, it's going to be transformed into your bloodstream, into glucose. Your body is then going to release insulin from the pancreas, as, as you know, um, which uh, will let you take that glucose into your cells for use or for storage. But when the glucose spike is high, your body really will send out a big insulin surge. And sometimes it can overshoot and basically suck up tons of glucose really quickly into your cells and lead to a dip, actually lower glucose levels than before your meal. And that little phase is called reactive hypoglycemia. And often that can be associated with anxiety, mood, lability, fatigue, 
maybe some brain fog and cravings for sure. A lot of what I'm thinking about when I'm eating is how do I avoid reactive hypoglycemia and how you can avoid it is by keeping things much more like gentle rolling hills in your glucose, never having that huge insulin surge. You're just kind of like staying around a safe sort of median level during the day. Glucose variability often translates into variability in my actual day subjectively, Mm. whether it's mood, energy, athletic performance, brain sharpness. And so for me, one of the best life hacks of my life has been just figuring out how to keep glucose more stable so that my days feel just more stable. When we eat too much sugar, this massive overload of this substrate, what that does is it causes stress on the mitochondria and creates damage. Imagine you had a factory that was making something like cheese and all of a sudden you get a hundred times more of the raw product like milk delivered to the factory. The, The workers would be like, we don't know where to put this. We can't work. They go on strike. There's nowhere to store it. It would all go bad. All of a sudden you actually produce less cheese, even though you have more substrate. We are giving so much of the substrate to the body that it's gumming up the system it's breaking down the factory and creating problems one of the best things absolutely best things we could do to reduce our heart disease risk is to get the blood sugar into a much more stable sort of gentle rolling hills um, situation not the big uh, peaks and valleys not a pill not a doctor's visit not a surgery it comes down to the choices that we're making every day about our exposures about what we're eating about how much sugar we're having about how much sleep we're getting the movement we're doing the toxins we're exposing Mm. ourselves to how we're supporting our microbiome our micronutrient status these are the hundreds of micro decisions we make every single day i mean if you can keep your blood sugar in a stable and healthy range throughout your lifetime, I'm fairly confident that you're never going to walk into a doctor's office one year and get a huge bomb dropped on you, that you have a metabolic condition. If you're looking day after day, year after year, and knowing that what you're putting in your body is not causing these huge spikes, you have unlocked the door to essentially minimizing your risk drastically of all of the conditions that are killing Americans. If you're an American adult, you're just on a trajectory uh, towards, towards getting a blood sugar problem. And the vast majority of these cases are totally preventable.